Welcome to the Connect Care 3 conversation, Diabetes Detour, Your Roadmap to a Sweeter Future. I'm Deb Rodema, Nurse Navigator with Connect Care 3. And I'm Janice Shan, a health coach with Connect Care 3. And I'm another Nurse Navigator. My name's Donna Penny and I'm with Connect Care 3. So today we're going to be having a conversation about type 2 diabetes, um, what it is, who's at risk, why it's important to talk about it, and then most importantly, what we can do to reduce the likelihood of developing it. So to get started, what is diabetes? So there are three types, type one, gestational, and type two. And the cause of each one is a little different, but the underlying issue is the same, and that is there is too much glucose or sugar in the bloodstream. And today we're gonna to be talking about type two diabetes because that is the most common type um, it accounts for about 98% uh, of all cases. And typically, um, it starts later in life, uh, like age 45 or older, um, although it is becoming much more common in younger people. So what happens is when you eat, the stomach breaks down food into different nutrients, um, and that includes small sugar particles called glucose. And the glucose is then absorbed into the bloodstream and that then triggers the pancreas to begin producing insulin. And you can think of insulin as like a key that opens up the cells and allows the glucose to go from the bloodstream into the cell. And the cells then use the glucose as a main source of energy for the body. But sometimes that system isn't working correctly and then you have a buildup of glucose in the blood. So there are basically uh, two reasons why that happens. One is the pancreas is not producing enough insulin. And the second is that the cells become resistant to that key-like effect of the insulin and it doesn't allow the glucose to go into the cell very easily. But either way, that glucose builds up in the bloodstream. And then that excess uh, glucose in the bloodstream causes Lots of issues in the body, but we'll talk about that more later. Um, so we're going to look at a slide and look at a few statistics. 38.4 million Americans have diabetes, and that is a huge number. Um, so that if we break that down, that translates into one out of 10 people having diabetes. And it's estimated that one out of five people who have diabetes aren't even aware that they have it. 97.6 million American adults have prediabetes. And I don't want to confuse things too much by mentioning prediabetes when we're talking about diabetes. But I mention it because prediabetes is often the precursor to developing type 2 diabetes. And Donna, you're really good at remembering that one statistic about prediabetes. Oh, yeah. So those that have prediabetes, if they don't make any lifestyle changes, 30% will go on to develop diabetes within three, three to five years. That's a pretty amazing statistic. So it's kind of a wake up call too, right? If you develop prediabetes, oh, yeah. you want to start making some changes so that it doesn't go into type two diabetes. Um, next, healthcare costs are estimated to be 2.6 times higher in someone diagnosed with diabetes compared with someone without diabetes. And then finally, to add to these very sobering statistics, diabetes is the eighth leading cause of death in the United States. So the good news is, knowing this, knowledge, right, knowledge is power. Um, so that's why we're talking about this today, just trying to educate everybody about this. And next, Janice is going to talk about factors that put you at a higher risk for developing diabetes. Yep. Yes, as you said, Deb, um, someone could have diabetes and not even know it because there are often no symptoms. So it's important to look at the risk factors. There are risk factors that you have no control over, and there are ones that you do have control over. The uncontrollable risk factors for diabetes are anyone aged 45 and over has an increased risk for type 2 diabetes. If you have a family history of type 2 type diabetes, <clears throat> meaning if your mother, your father, your sister, or your brother has type 2, you have the increased risk of developing the disease. If you have a history of gestational diabetes, like when you were pregnant, um, your risk for type 2 diabetes is increased. 
and race and ethnicity. Black, Hispanic, American Indian, and Asian Americans have an increased risk for type 2 diabetes. Now, the good news is there are some things that you do, you can control. Uh, the risk factors that you can control are uh, being overweight, especially if you carry it around your waist, physical activity less than three times a week, and high blood pressure. So what if you have some of these uncontrollable risk factors? Double review the symptoms of diabetes next. So the symptoms of type 2 diabetes um, can be mild, and so we can kind of easily explain them away or just ignore them. Um, but as a result, the person may have the disease for years before it's diagnosed, and by then, complications have already started. So early diagnosis is important to help prevent the effects of type 2 diabetes. And the best way to detect it early is to get regular checkups and blood tests with a healthcare provider. Typical symptoms of high blood sugar include increased thirst, increased urination, increased hunger, blurry vision, fatigue, numbness or tingling in the feet or hands, frequent infections such as vaginal yeast infections, and slow healing sores. So you can think of it as a continuum where symptoms may be noticeable occasionally, like maybe after a large meal when your blood pressure or blood sugar spikes. Um, it's not like you know, a light switch where one day you have prediabetes and you don't have any symptoms and the next day you kind of cross over that line. Now you have diabetes and all of a sudden you have symptoms. It's a lot more gradual than that. So it's just good to be aware of what some of the symptoms can be. Um, know that they can be gradual and just try and listen to your body. But the best way to identify it, like I said, is to have blood tests done. Um, and Don is going to go over those tests and the numbers associated with that and why it's important to catch these issues early. Yep, absolutely. So um, on the screen, you're gonna see two arrows and I'm gonna tell you about the tests that are used to determine if someone has diabetes and those two tests are the fasting plasma glucose and the hemoglobin A1C. You'll see the fasting plasma glucose on the left and then that A1C is on the right. And when you look at that arrow on the left, the fasting plasma glucose test is actually measuring your blood glucose after fasting for eight hours. So it's gonna be a snapshot of what your blood sugar, blood glucose level is at that point in time. And you're gonna see, if you look at the bottom of the arrow, um, your, your normal blood glucose should be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. And moving up the arrow, prediabetes comes next, which that level falls between 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter. And what prediabetes means is that you have a higher than normal blood glucose level and that as we mentioned earlier, is going to put you at an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Now with prediabetes, there's one in three people that are going to have prediabetes and 80% don't know that they have it. And this is why it's important when you start to recognize that prediabetes is out there and that it is something that, you know, maybe you have or you're being told that you have it. That's why lifestyle changes are so important because at this point in time, it can help lower the risk of developing diabetes by 58%. So that's huge. Mm -hmm. um, and to define where diabetes takes place, so that's going to be when your fasting blood glucose is 126 milligrams per deciliter or more. So now looking at that arrow on the right, you have your hemoglobin A1C. And what that is going to tell us is it's going to give us an average of your glucose for the past two to three months. And it's measured as a percentage. And because it doesn't require fasting, you can have your blood work drawn at any point in time throughout the course of the day. And I will note that your hemoglobin A1C is the primary test that's used for diabetes management as well as research. And a lower percentage indicates better glucose control, while a higher percentage indicates that you have less control over this condition. So looking at the arrow on the right, the A1C, your um, normal reading should be less than 5.7%. 
prediabetes is going to occur when your A1C falls between 5.7 and 6.4%, and then diabetes is 6.5% or higher. And I mentioned that there should be two tests done to confirm this. It's not based on one and done. And there's going to be other tests too, but you know, typically we, we look at um, diabetes and having two separate A1C tests being higher than 6.5%. All it, right. And also um, it would need to be diagnosed by your primary care provider, right? Yes. It's not like you can just look at the numbers and decide that you have this on, you know, pre-diabetes or diabetes. You can't decide that on your own. Correct? No, no. It's, it's a collection of things. I mean, they'll look at urine, they'll look at blood, they'll look at uh, weight. Um, it all comes together to support that diagnosis. And then, you know, you go forward. I think it's it, important to understand, you know, because we're all crazy about these numbers, but, you know, those numbers tell us that there's too much glucose in your bloodstream. And when that happens, and that's for prolonged periods of time, um, it matters because it can affect the organs in your body mm -hmm. and it can damage those blood vessels. So like over time, you know, if you have too much sugar, it's gonna affect your vision um, because it could lead to vision loss, it could lead to blindness. And that we refer to as retinopathy. If it begins to affect your kidneys, then we call that nephropathy. And blood vessels and nerves, when they are impacted by having too much sugar in your body for prolonged periods of time, that's neuropathy. And I think that one is, is it's talked about more frequently. Um, and the last one is cardiovascular disease. That's one of the other complications when you have too much sugar floating around in your blood vessels for a long period of time it's going to increase that risk of stroke, heart attack, and heart failure. And of course, you know, treatment is recommended by a healthcare provider, and then lifestyle changes can also help. And all, you know, combining those two, it's gonna help prevent these complications. All right, so let's take a quick look at diabetes treatment. So what that involves is regulating your blood glucose levels and of course, you know, taking good care of yourself. And then treatment is gonna consist of regular visits with your primary care provider. And there's also endocrinologists that you can, you know, visit with and um, tap into their knowledge to help you with your diabetes. Another piece to this, it falls into the self-care category would be like regular blood glucose monitoring, whether it's glucose testing at home or the A1C test that your provider is going to ask you to do. And we have, um, gosh, more readily available to people now are the uh, continuous glucose monitors. Mm -hmm. So they're super valuable because you can see instantaneously what um, maybe you ate something and you can see what happens to your blood sugar. Um, if you go out and walk a mile, you can see what happens to your blood sugar. So that feedback is so helpful to people when they're learning how to deal with this condition. Which takes me to lifestyle changes. So education is absolutely essential. Can't overstress that enough. With a diabetes educator, preferably, because they understand the diagnosis, they understand how the treatment works, and they can help you understand those things um, and, and get a better handle on what you need to do. Regular exercise is another lifestyle change, not change, but challenge for some, um, that you will have to learn to work into your life. And we'll get into that a little later. And then of course, following a healthy diet to improve blood, blood glucose levels long-term is absolutely helpful as well. So lifestyle changes are gonna be the best way to prevent or delay the onset of type two diabetes. And uh, speaking of those dietary um, changes that can be made, yeah, Janice will mm -hmm. talk a little bit more in depth about them and help you understand those a little bit better. Yep. Yes, well, following a healthy diet is so important for everyone, but especially those with diabetes. And uh, the American Diabetes, diabetes Association recognized that many factors go into creating a healthy eating plan for diabetes and they are very clear that there is no one specific diabetes diet. So basically what is good for everyone is good for diabetics. 
So that um, includes a diet that is um, including plenty of fruit and fruits and vegetables, lean protein, whole grains, and low fat dairy. So eating these well-balanced meals can also decrease the risk of complications and diseases related to diabetes, such as heart disease. So now on this screen here, um, we have the diabetes plate. And this is just a nice guide to help you balance out your meals. Um, if you fill half of your plate with non-starchy vegetables, one quarter of your plate with lean protein, and one quarter of your plate with starch or carbohydrate foods. So what is a non-starchy vegetable? They have less sugar, like broccoli, cauliflower, dark leafy greens. Um, your carbs should be whole grains, meaning trying to stay away from white rice or pasta. And um, the starchy vegetables are the ones that have a little bit more sugar, like potatoes or corn. So um, if you do have diabetes, developing an eating pattern is important. So this can be as explained as consistent carb intake throughout the day and being mindful to not skip meals. And uh, like we have said already, carbohydrates have the most impact for people with diabetes because they are broken down into glucose in order to be used as energy for our cells. Understanding the importance of balancing carbohydrates for snacks and meals is key. You don't want to have a sugar spike. So balancing carbs with, <coughs> excuse me, balancing carbs with protein, fats, or non-starchy vegetables can be helpful for people with diabetes. An example of this could be pairing an apple with peanut butter or whole wheat crackers with string cheese. And uh, limiting alcohol intake can be helpful. The recommendation is no more than one drink per day for women and no more than two drinks per day for men, if at all. Alcohol is high in calories and low in nutrients, so that's why they call it empty calories. Plus, when your liver breaks down the alcohol, it turns that alcohol into fat. So alcohol can actually make you gain weight. And many alcoholic drinks have a lot of carbs in them too, so that's something to watch out for. Exercise is so important for diabetes prevention and treatment, and now Ta Donna will discuss that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So exercise is going to help you get that insulin into the cells, like Deb was talking about earlier, so that your body can have fuel, so that you can keep going. And it also helps with blood sugar control. And it's been proven that exercise can help lower your A1C levels, your blood sugar levels, for up to 24 hours after a workout. So let me tell you about three different types of exercise that are gonna be important in the management of diabetes. Um, you'll see on the screen, we have resistance training, cardiopulmonary, and then flexibility. So with resistance training, you're going to want to have two or more days per week where you go and you lift weights or you do some push-ups or use machines at the gym. So what you're shooting for here is to keep your muscles strong. Then with cardiopulmonary or cardio, as many people refer to it, it's any exercises that help raise your heart rate, such as biking, hiking, um, swimming, cycling, um, lots jogging. of things. What's that? Jogging. Jogging. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all of that's going to help develop strong heart and strong lungs. And so you're going to want to aim for 150 minutes of moderate activity or 75 minutes of vigorous activity per week. Um, and, the, and you can break that up. You don't have to you know, do it all at once. You can break it up throughout the day. Then flexibility is basically stretching your muscles. Um, three days a week is what you should go for, and you can do like, you know, yoga or just simple arm circles or um, stretching in your cubicle. I know we uh, sometimes have little, what do we call them, micro breaks or something, yeah. and um, we have one person in the office who will lead us in a couple of exercises just to help us stretch because, you know, we've been using the same muscles all day, looking down, um, so we do all sorts of fun short stretches that just yeah, get can you I, away from that. I always feel like I can focus so much better mm -hmm. after I take that little break and do some stretches, just, you know, I, I don't know, kind of wake myself up again after sitting in front of the computer. It's mm -hmm. so helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, so incorporating these three different types, the resistance, the cardio, the flexibility can help with regulating your blood glucose levels. Um, and then Deb, Deb, don't you have some study that proves 
the value of movement and with diabetes? Right. So there was a study that was published um, December of 2022 uh, by the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. And it talked about how important frequent movement is. Um, so they looked at um, information from the wearable devices, you know, that people wear on their wrists. And they compared that with um, medical records and diabetes. And they, they looked at over 5,000 people. Uh, most of them were women, but they found that uh, people whose daily step counts averaged 10,700 at the start of the study were 44% less likely to develop diabetes over the following four years compared with those people who only had about 6,000 steps per day. So, you know, the study just basically is talking about the benefits of that movement. I mean, you talk about those specific types of exercise and those are very important too, but just frequent movement on top of that, you know, just getting out moving like we were talking about and maybe going for a little walk, just getting those steps in throughout the day is really gonna help you. So just super valuable evidence that you know, exercise mm -hmm. movement is, is so important in the care of people that do have diabetes. And you know, it's important to note that if diet and exercise do not regulate your blood glucose levels, medications are available. But remember, there's no medication that can cure type two diabetes at this point in time, 10 years from now, when you, you never know. But you know, healthy diet and exercise are your first steps in controlling those blood glucose levels. And you know, it's also important to remember that while you're taking care of your physical health, don't forget about your mental health and Janice will address that. Yes, absolutely. Taking care of your mental health is just as important as taking care of your physical health when we're talking about diabetes. People with diabetes are two to three times more likely to experience depression. People with diabetes are 20% more likely to have anxiety than those without diabetes. Caring for the mind and body are both important because when mental health concerns improve, diabetes tends to improve as well and vice versa. Getting some exercise, being in nature, talking with a friend, getting some me time are all good ways to help you with your, your mental health. Um, even schedule it on your calendar. It's that important. And if you feel like you've tried to improve your mental health and you just feel like you need a little bit more help, you can always reach out to a healthcare provider and or a counselor. It's, it's just so important to take care of your mental health. And, and you can get some help. Don't think that you're on this, you know, you're, you're in this all, all by yourself. Um, also, if you smoke as a way to manage your stress, it's also a good idea to quit. People who smoke cigarettes are 30 to 40% more likely to develop type 2 diabetes than people who don't smoke. In fact, the more cigarettes you smoke, the higher your risk for type 2 diabetes. So in summary, there are things that you can do to take charge of your health. You can make the lifestyle changes we spoke about, which is getting enough exercise, eating a healthy diet, quitting smoking and managing your stress. You can talk with your healthcare team and educate yourself. The main message is that you do have some control over this. You don't have to just accept it if it's in your family. Um, if you have those uncontrollable risk factors, you can and should do those, <clears throat> do those lifestyle changes to prevent diabetes and help your health. Also, if you have diabetes, the lifestyle changes can help to prevent the disease from getting worse. And just if I can put a little plug in, yeah. just catching this, uh, these issues early is so important. So like we were saying before, you know, going for your yearly checkup and having blood work done, because that's how you're going to find that maybe your sugars are getting a little elevated and we need to make some changes before it continues on to type 2 diabetes. Yes, absolutely. Great point. So thank you for tuning in. And during our next Connect Care 3 conversation, our nutrition team will lead, lead a live Q&A session called the Wellbeing Puzzle, continuing the conversation. Following today's presentation, you will be prompted to take a survey, which will include a spot to list your nutrition questions and interests. So be on the lookout for that. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.